So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jonathan Camboris. I am the president for the Hellenic Preservation Society of Northeastern Ohio. It is my honor and privilege to introduce a Hellenic patriot of Northeastern Ohio, Athanasios Serentopoulos, or Thanasi, or Athan. He has many nicknames. Athan, as he is nicknamed in Youngstown, has always been invested in the Greek community. He has been a longtime board member of HPS, serving as the liaison and delegate for the Greek Cultural Garden, and a tireless advocate for the annual One World Day event. He serves on multiple boards, including the HEO Society, and also chants in Byzantine style at Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church in Tremont. To say the least, Athanasio stands as an inspiration of leadership, patriotism, and unwavering dedication to the Greeks of Northeastern Ohio. The phrase, strength in numbers, catches multiple meanings with him, including his knowledge and talent for mathematics. When I tell you all things are numbers in his head, I do mean that. This is including when I was first working up in Cleveland and him describing the street and the grid of Cleveland and its addresses and streets, which are very easily a mathematical equation in his head. This is a true story. <laughs> in any event, Athanasios is educated and is also an educator. He graduated Youngstown State University with a Bachelor of Science and Ohio State University with a Master of Arts. For anyone that does not have a graduate degree, it is not an easy feat. I do hear many stories of how Athanasios is an amazing and real teacher of math at the university and the K-12 levels. He even describes himself as a realist. Again, I'm honored to introduce Athanasios Serentopoulos. Let's all give him a warm welcome as we await his lecture. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Just a little correction. I, my undergraduate was at Ohio State, where I studied mathematics with a BS and a BA in modern Greek studies. And then uh, I taught and got my master's degree, my master's of science and math at Youngstown State. I'm very grateful for those institutions. Uh, I got to learn an awful lot, and I, I welcome you all for just a little session of lifelong learning. Uh, one of the things that we have to do in the Hellenic Preservation Society is, is this Greek experience is actually uh, understanding how things work together and uh, piecing together culture and um, advancement. And what happens is things like what we're going to be discussing today uh, are paramount and they're repeating themselves and they're making the world a better place. So I'm glad that the gardens are alive and well. We're looking forward to One World Day next week. Uh, to stamp those passports and so please please come back again because all the gardens will be showing everything that they need to show uh, today's topic is demystifying what we call the golden ratio the golden ratio is something interesting because uh, I first learned about it on something called Donald Duck in math magic land which is you could look it up on YouTube and uh, it was converted from the old reels and they showed the Pythagoreans and the, uh, of course everything was a little uh, generalized Donald Duck got messed up and you know squares trying to figure out his uh, you know his surface area or something I don't know what it was but they talked about the golden uh, ratio there and we denote it by this letter phi which we call phi right uh, and it's captured the imagination of mathematicians, artists, architects, and thinkers for centuries. This mathematical proportion, which is actually uh, like 1.618, I'm not going to do uh, 1.618, okay? Um, it goes on, it's, it's an irrational number. So, unfortunately, it possesses a unique quality that transcends disciplines and resonates with a sense of aesthetic harmony. From the architecture of ancient civilizations to the intricate patterns of nature, the golden ra ratio's ubiquity underscores its significance as a fundamental principle of design and beauty. 
So here's what it is in layman's terms, right? If a rectangle is in this analogy of say 1.618 to 1, okay? If you cut off a square, you're left with a new rectangle, which is in direct proportion to the first one. And if you cut off a square from this one, this is directly proportional to this, which is directly proportional to this. And so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. Amazing. It repeats itself into infinity. And if you notice, and I have my crude um, measurements with my phone, perhaps the golden ratio is hidden in this larger rectangle, which includes what we're going to have as our freeze uh, and going down. When I calculated with my phone, we were within 2 or 3% of what the real golden ratio is. And I'm not surprised at all because we're in the Hellenic Gardens. We're in the Greek Gardens. and the minds that designed it must have tried to incorporate this magic ratio in it. Do I have any proof? No. Uh, perhaps Andy does. I don't know. He could look into it. So it's, it's an amazing thing. What happens basically is, as I showed you earlier, uh, and we'll cut this off, if this is A, 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 right? This is a, a square as we know it, and this is B, uh, this side has the length A plus B, and of course this side has the length A. And the ratio of this A plus B to A, I'm sorry because I'm not in front, the ratio of this A plus B to A is actually this 1.618, which is one plus the square root of five over two. Looks beautiful, doesn't it? Right? Uh, and if we were to cut this out again, whatever the other analogies would be, it would be the same, right? Because it, it repeats itself. So it's, a, it's an amazing thing, right? Um, they originally, uh, in Euclid, in his elements, he was able to show how it could be constructed. And it only involves knowing what the Pythagorean theorem is, which we all remember. It's on Gary's shirt, right? Yeah, good. <laughs> So if you only had a straight edge and a compass and started with a square, and you went to the midpoint of that square, and we call this one unit, and this is a half a unit, and this is half a unit, right? If I go from this midpoint, forgive my art, it's going to look a little better this way. It's this radius here could be found easily by using the Pythagorean theorem, right? We would say that this one-half squared plus one squared equals r squared. What this radius winds up being is the square root of five over two. So if they were going to take this up to here, which creates the, the length of this, would be, uh, I'm sorry, here. this is the square root of 5 over 2, blah, 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 from here to here. And it leads us to this being the phi, right? Which winds up being, what was that phi? The 1.618? If I were to take the square root of 5, over 2 plus the 1 half that's on the bottom, I would be getting 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2. And so that's where it comes from. Please excuse my crude artwork, okay? I'm not, I have some handouts that Jonathan can show you, and that, that'll be the extent of the mathematics of today. Yeah, you can pass those around if you'd like to. Yeah, sure. Okay. The historical roots 
and the mathematical exploration of this. The origins of the golden ratio trace back to ancient Greece, cradle of mathematical thought and philosophical inquiry. Pythagoras and his followers were among the first to explore the mathematical properties of this proportion, recognizing its presence in geometric relationships and the construction of polygons. However, it was in the renowned uh, work of the mathematician Euclid who formalized the concept of the golden ratio in his monumental work, The Elements. His geometric approach highlighted the ratio's self-similar properties, which was amazing. The golden ratio was studied by ancient Greek mathematicians because of its frequent appearance in geometry. Plato had a system of triads that formed the perfect face. There was, the first lecture here was on Plato, so I thought I'd bring that up. Um, and he would divide the human face from the hairline to the eyes, the eyes to the upper lip, and the upper lip to the chin. The ideal visage had to be of the certain proportions of the dividing and sectioning. So when we say the divine, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, the golden section or the golden mean or the golden ratio, we're talking about the same thing. Krisi tomi, right? Tomi is the Greek word for sect when you cut something, right? So when you see words like, say, hysterectomy, right? We're talking about something being cut just so you understand to make that clear. So they, they refer to this as the section because they recognized this dividing or sectioning property that was repeating itself. Um, in my research for this, uh, there is, I was drawn to an Israeli-American astrophysicist, Mario Livio, and uh, he wrote a book called The Golden Ratio, The Story of Phi, the world's most astonishing number. And he wrote that book in 2002, so it's relatively early. Um, he states that some of the greatest mathematical minds of all ages, from Pythagoras and Euclid in ancient Greece, through the medieval Italian mathematician Leonardo of Pisa, Fibonacci, and the Renaissance, Renaissance astronomer Johannes Kepler, to present-day scientific figures such as Oxford physicist Roger Penrose, have spent endless hours over this simple ratio and its properties. But the fascination with the golden ratio is not confined just to mathematicians. Biologists, artists, musicians, historians, architects, psychologists, and even mystics have pondered and debated the basis of its ubiquity and appeal. In fact, it's probably fair to say that the golden ratio has inspired thinkers of all disciplines like no other number in the history of mathematics. That's pretty significant. Of course, we're all familiar with P, or pi as we call it in, in English, right? Which was the 3.14 we know, any circle's cir uh, circumference divided by its diameter. But it didn't have the, the appeal that this did because of its way that it was being duplicated. And since we're here at the Greek gardens, uh, let's look at into which Greeks or Hellenes or Philhellenes use the golden ratio. Uh, because remember that these gardens represent Greece's gift to civilization. Uh, and we're going to see it was, it's part of what we found in our research of these that's driving the whole project that we're doing with the frieze. Phidias, whose name is here. He was a renowned Greek sculptor and architect who lived around 480, 430 BC, and he's known for his work on the Parthenon. Okay, you see this right here. Very famous in, in Athens. Including the sculpture that adorned it, uh, the sculptures. It's believed that Phidias incorporated the golden ratio into the design of some of his sculptures, particularly in relation to the proportions of the human body. For instance, the dimensions of the Parthenon itself have been analyzed in relation to the golden ratio, 
particularly in its length, width, and dimensions of various architectural elements. And the ratio of length of the Parthenon to its width has been suggested to be close to the golden ratio. Additionally, some scholars suggest that the proportions of certain sculptural features, such as the height and width of the columns, might be in harmony with the golden ratio. Euclid, of course, who I talked about earlier, around 300 BC, famous for the elements. He didn't directly mention the, the golden ratio, but he provided geometrical constructions that related to it. And uh, one involved in dividing a line segment. I believe I went through that with the square uh, that, that did it. Archimedes is another famous one who's on our list as well. So three of our, so far, I think there's going to be a couple more that I'm going to talk about. Uh, Archimedes, around 287 to, uh, to 212 BC, where he was a brilliant mathematician and inventor, and some historians suggest that he might be aware of the golden ratio, as some of his geometric constructions are related to proportions that are close to it. Remember, history is very debatable, and uh, it's the most important thing to me qualitatively is where this could be used later on. I don't come to the table as a historian. Uh, many, many times things are uh, debated, and that's the job of the historian to do. Uh, one particular sculptor I want to speak about is perhaps one of the, uh, unarguably one of the best, uh, Praxitelis, who also is included on our wall. Uh, the sculptor Praxitelis stands as an innovative master. He embraced the principles of the golden ratio, demonstrating the profound connection between mathematics and aesthetics in his works. He was renowned for his ability to capture the human form in marble with an unprecedented sense of naturalism and grace. There's a copy here at our museum, and uh, I remember going 10, 15 years ago to see it, and the guide was able to show me very distinctly the harmony and beauty of the, of the sculpture, and he didn't necessarily mention to me the, the golden ratio, but in my mind, I do feel that even based on what I have here, that, that he was aware. His sculptures were celebrated for their sensual and emotive qualities, all, often depicting gods, goddesses, and idealized human figures. It's within this context that the influence of the golden ratio in his artistic creation becomes apparent. Uh, there's the, the famous Aphrodite of Milos, the Venus de Milo, which was done by Alexandros of uh, Antioch, because the, the Hellenistic age included the great cities, right, like Antioch in the Near East, right, in the greater Syrian age. If you go there, you could find many, many remnants of the Hellenistic culture, and um, that's very famous, and it's been analyzed to have influence on, to, be, to have been influenced by the golden ratio. So just as Praxiteles transformed the cold marble into living form, the golden ratio infused his works with a divine proportion that continues to captivate and inspire admirers across generations. Uh, there's a whole school, I would say, or idea of sacred geometry, and it exists in other cultures too, especially uh, cultures in the East. And it's... Uh, it's interesting how the significance of a number like this phi that we're talking about has that same sort of air to it. There are more applications though. Okay, So the golden ratio is often used in art and architecture to cr create visibly, visually pleasing and harmonious designs. It can be observed in the proportions of the famous artworks such as Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. And you can see the Mona Lisa here in this, in this picture here, and how it was in, interpreted to be influenced by the, the golden ratio. And also, uh, the Vitruvian Man, which is, we've all seen it before. I have two renditions, one which is a sketch and one in which they've, uh, they've placed the golden rectangle which is repeating itself through the pattern. It's pretty amazing. And it, it, as we saw the Parthenon in here, and uh, also there's some other natural things I'm going to talk about a little later. 
So that we could put this in context, uh, here are some specific art applications of the golden ratio. Visual composition. The golden ratio is frequently used to determine the placement of elements within a composition, guiding artists in creating balanced and aesthetically pleasing arrangements. In photography, photographers also often use the golden ratio to position the main subject or key elements in a photograph, resulting in an engaging and harmonious composition. If we even look at our TV screen resolutions, one of the options is that 16 to 9, which is not quite the golden mean, but pretty close to it. And um, the funny thing about 16 and 9, they create a Pythagorean triple, right? 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared, which was one of the key um, secrets that the Pythagoreans had back in time. Of course, we talked about sculpture, but in painting and drawing, artists apply the golden ratio when determining the proportions of elements within their artwork, leading to a sense of balance and proportion that resonates with viewers. Even in typography and graphic design, designers integrate the golden ratio when choosing font sizes, spacing, and layout in printed materials websites and other graphical elements so we're talking about something from the ancients which is coming up even in today's technologically advanced society we know how uh, ubiquitous the internet is and fonts that i can remember even as a grad student we didn't have a, a lot of choices of what font we would use on a computer now it's you can even create their apps to help you create your own ones but uh it's a sense of order and balance, and perhaps we're wired to, uh, to react in a certain way when we see figures of that, right? Uh, sometimes things are out of that balance, and that also can evoke some sort of result, you know, some sort of response from, from us, you know, right? As, as we learn more about learning, as we learn about more how the mind works, these kind of things show up. So, um, in nature, uh, before I talk about nature, I really have to bring up um, the mathematician Leonardo of Pisa, who was Fibonacci. Um, they're over there, right? The Italian garden is our neighbor over there, and uh, it's our neighbor to, uh, and in Greece, they're our neighbor to the west. And we all know that there was a profound influence on uh, Italian culture because of the fact that Greece was uh, right next door. Uh, Roman gods paralleled the Greek gods, different names, basically the same. Uh, their um, Greek thought influenced Roman thought. Marcus Aurelius, for example, was very, very influenced by the, the Greek Stoics uh, to the point where his meditations were written in Greek. They weren't written in, in Latin. Uh, Epictetus, who was a... Uh, a slave, a Greek slave, but a philosopher influenced uh, people over there in Italy, the Romans, we would say. But uh, Fibonacci had, it was in the 11th, 12th, uh, the 12th century, I believe, and early 13th century. And uh, we have to understand that these numbers that I'm using, like a, a 1, a 2, a 3, you know, the, the Hindu Arabic numerals weren't used by the Greeks or the, or the, uh, the Romans for that matter, right? We, we, we're familiar with Roman numerals, how the the four is the one and the V, right? Um, and in Greek, we actually were using the, the letters, the alpha, the beta, the gamma, they were using different tildes to, to represent other quantities of it. So, um, Fibonacci basically brought the Hindu uh, Arabic numerals into into the way we, we dealt with mat, with maths, right? Because in mathematics, you know, the, the, the concept of zero doesn't exist in nature. So even though we know that Archimedes was, uh, and other great Greek, the uh, Diophantes, so many mathematicians that come from ancient Greece, they they were very philosophical about the natural numbers and um, and the rational, rational numbers. They understood that, but they did not use the same notation that we use uh, today. So uh, what Fibonacci had, he had a, a, simple, he had a, a very famous sequence, right? Um, I'll start with the one. Oh, you could start what? Like, zero, one, one, two, three, five, eight. Right? And you could figure out that subsequently each of these numbers is just uh, after you deal with well, zero plus one gives you one, one plus one gives you two, two plus one gives you three, 
3 plus 2 equals 5, 5 plus 3, 8, 13, and many, many, many more, right? We could take them out further. Something very interesting happens with these numbers. Uh, if we take 3 and divide it by 2, we get 1.5. If we take 8 divided by 5, we suddenly get 1.6, which is awful, awfully close to this golden uh, ratio. And uh, in fact, as, as you take it further, you tend to, to, to limit, to, by the time you're at the, the 25th or 30th Fibonacci number, the one divided by the one, the previous number has given you that. So if you notice a lot of these visuals that have been passed around, uh, we notice this, these spirals, that's what Fibonacci was able to do, okay? Um, he saw that spiral, and that spiral is actually in nature. The spiral in nature that adheres to the golden ratio is uh, referred to the, as the golden spiral, or the Fibonacci spiral. Uh, I have not studied Fibonacci enough to know if he was influenced uh, directly by Greek philosophy or uh, obviously, you know, in that part of the world, it's, I can't say safe to say, I know there's a, a that's for historians to, to figure out, uh, if I have time I guess I could delve into that, but um, really gave a big explanation to the way I understand it, which helps me with my students when I try to tell them how important these things are uh, as far as how we have to think about thinking and how think things are designed and, and other things like that. Uh, the Fibonacci sequence, of course, I went through it, but there's a connection of the Fibonacci sequence and the golden mean, and that always fascinated me. So uh, I did a little bit of arithmetic and we uncovered something pretty special, right? Uh, so what happens is they draw these quarter circles with radii equal to the Fibonacci numbers. You could probably see it in, uh, which is a good one. Yeah, well, in the, this Parthenon one, right? And, and it keeps going on. And if you, uh, they have actually, online you could find that they have the numbers and they add up together. But it's, it's pretty amazing how, like in the Nautilus shell, it's a classic example of a living organism that exhibits a golden spiral pattern. The chambers of this shell increase in size following the Fibonacci sequence, creating a spiral pattern. In sunflowers, the seeds in the center of a sunflower often form spirals that follow the Fibonacci sequence. Pine cones, the arrangement of scales on a pine cone often follow the Fibonacci sequence and exhibit spiral patterns. Even hurricanes, you notice this hurricane here. The structure of certain hurricanes and cloud formations can be approximated by a, a golden spiral. Of course, they're not falling into direct uh, analogy of it. We have to seek to find these examples, but it, it's pretty interesting. Even people who are involved in, um, in stock trading and retracing on how uh, they use the Fibonacci sequence in, in and doing their technical analysis of buying uh, stocks, and and they look at what they consider to be influences by it. Is it absolute? No, it's not absolute, but it's it's a tool that people use. Some people can attribute, you know, fortunes. I'm sure other people have lost fortunes trying to do it. So I don't know, but uh, they say that some spiral galaxies, including the famous Milky Way, and. Uh, a lot of us need to know, when we talk about galactic, we're using the word gala, the Greek word for milk, right? And so when we talk about the, the Milky Way and, uh, and something, a galaxy, they're interchangeable it, linguistically. When we make the, uh, I always try to point out Greek words or concepts that come through so that we can see how, how it's connected. Um, they say that in the famous Milky Way, there are spiral, spiral arms that follow patterns resembling the golden spiral. So these examples highlight the prevalence of the golden spiral in, in several natural forms, suggesting that this mathematical ratio could be associated and in, uh, ingrained in growth patterns of living organisms and other natural processes. 
So in conclusion, I hope that I managed to convey the notion that the golden ratio represents and give you a glimpse towards this interconnectedness of mathematics, art, and nature. The influence of this phenomenon spans centuries and cultures, embodying the universal quest for beauty and order, whether found in the intricate spirals of seashells or in the proportions of iconic works of art or blueprints of an architectural wonder, the golden ratio's presence underscores humanity's pursuit for aesthetic harmony in the realms of both the constructed and the natural. As we continue to explore the world around us, the golden ratio serves as a reminder that beneath the complexity lies a simple and elegant principle. Remember, it all came from that little square that when you went from the midpoint of the square to the corner, and, and did just the A squared plus B squared equals C squared that you all learned in high school, right? And extended it off, you got that. So they were able to, to create the uh, a golden rectangle wasn't particularly that hard to do because if they just had a square to work with, they were able to extend it, right? So um, that elegant principle that speaks to the essence of design and creativity. Thank you.